Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted to welcome John Rochford today. John is the Program Director and Faculty Member of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Center at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. I know John through his work through the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force uh, for the W3C, where he's also contributing to the Low Vision and Silver Task Force. So, John is a titan in the world of accessibility. We are delighted to have you here. It's it's a real pleasure, and um, I've been a big fan of of you for a long time. So thank you, John. It's it's a uh, great to have you with us. Thank you. That's humbling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so honestly, I'm very much uh, pleased to have you here. How did you get started in 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 your work in accessibility? Uh, well, I run the information service in Massachusetts for people with disabilities. We started in 1986, and uh, it was always database driven, and people with disabilities always directly accessed our database. So we always made it as accessible as we could with the technology of the time. And so the, I got involved actually because we also do app, uh, technical development and we were building a database for an agency that Judy Brewer was the head of before she was at W3C. And so my supervisor said, go see Judy and find out what she means about this accessibility thing. Uh, and Judy was just adamant about accessibility. And I learned, that's why I started learning from her what that meant. And then um, from there, we uh, had various platforms that we published on our databases. And then when the web came along, I started experimenting with uh, websites and uh, I actually I published the very first website that I know of for people with disabilities and it was in 1993 and it, and it's the current disabilityinfo.org amazing that's so cool yeah yeah so that's the good news mm -hmm. and, oh come on give us the bad news then okay well um <laughs> So this is me admitting something that I'm ashamed of, which is that here I was developing websites for making sure that they're accessible, especially to the blind, because that was the focus for a long time. And what I've done my whole career is I have served people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including autism, and it just didn't occur to me for some time that people with intellectual disabilities would be using the web, would be on the web. Uh, and, and intellectual disabilities is the new term in the US anyway for uh, mental retardation. Uh, and in the UK, it's learning disabilities. But um, what I did was I started to, I put the word out and I said, I'd like to fix your computers. I'd like to help you get on the web. I'd like to do whatever you need. And as I was helping people, I was asking them, are you on the web? What are you doing on the web? And that's how my uh, passion started for making sure that the web is usable by people with intellectual disabilities, especially, but also people with autism, especially. And, and um, you know, you, you're on the web as clear helper, you know, because actually we need clarity as someone with uh, a cognitive uh, condition and dyslexia. I need that clarity. I need that usability. Um, so absolutely appreciate the efforts that you're making and the efforts of the whole cognitive accessibility task force hugely important because so many people are affected. Um, I know Deborah's got a question as well, so uh, go for it, Deborah. Neil. <clears throat> and welcome, John. I um, I know that I was an early member of CAGA, but wow, it, that's some intense volunteering work that you are doing over there with the W3C. This is not for the faint of heart. So uh, congratulations to all the leadership that you've shown in this. And you know what, John, you had mentioned that 
<clears throat> you you really wanted to help people with intellectual disabilities, you know, get on the internet and you know with technology and stuff. And um, my daughter, many people know, has Down syndrome, and it was interesting as people assume that uh, persons with dis persons with intellectual disabilities don't get on you know use devices and are on the internet they uh, definitely don't understand this this community because my daughter is so good on the she that she scares me she's so good on social media and on the computer and everything and often um, I'm pretty good but um, my husband um, now that he has dementia, he's forgetting how to do things. And so all this onslaught of technology coming at us and the changes and everything that's happening, um, it's very, very confusing for him and sometimes for me um, to use these devices and the Internet and all of that. Just a stupid example. My husband loves the hockey, and the National Hockey League um, is doing their uh, Stanley Cup finals. And so last night I was trying so hard to get him to that game and um, it, it and and we did not. And it, it turns out that the reason why I couldn't figure it out was because we actually um, have some bandwidth issues where I live with NBC, which is doing the games. But it's becoming very complicated, all these moving parts. And I think that's once again why it's so critical that we have the Kaga and we have we're making sure that we're focusing on making the web and everything else accessible to everybody, including people like my daughter, but also people like my husband that is actually losing functionality. And we know that people are turning, 10,000 people turn 65 every day this year all over the world. And there's 2.9 billion people over the age of 55 now. So I was just curious how the work you're doing with Kaga is, you know, you know, taking all of that into consideration, even though I think in some ways there's some of it is it's a real overlap of, um, you know, it's a real overlap. And I know, Neil, you're on Kaga, too. So um, I'll toss this to you and John. I'll let I'll let John go first because John spends a lot more time and invests a lot more effort than I do on it currently. And that's my shameful admission uh, for the day. <laughs> so. One of the things I talk about is the very wide spectrum of cognitive. And what I talk about is that on the low end are people with intellectual disabilities, and on the high end are everybody as they age. Uh, so we're not only acquiring physical disabilities as we age, but our executive functioning trouble, just like you're describing, right? And then along in that spectrum are people with uh, dyslexia and dyscalculia and ADHD, you know, there's just an enormous spectrum uh, depression. So um, what we do on the task force, what we decided to do early was to uh, figure out what the functional problems were across those clinical uh, definitions of disability. And then from that functional analyses, we started creating uh, issue papers and gap analyses and success criteria. And I, I think that's worked well. Neil, did you want to add uh, I to wonder, that? <clears throat> I will, I, only that, you know, the a lot of this stuff, as John said, hadn't been considered before. You know, it covers a, such a huge area, and and people had thought about um, accessibility being just a sort of technical interoperability challenge. Uh, and what this is 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 a, is a a totally different challenge because quite often there isn't the interoperability with other assistive technologies because people who have uh, you know cognitive accessibility needs quite often aren't using other assistive technology. They may use some, but quite often it's not it's not the the driver, it's not how they they drive their PC or they drive their phone in the same way that if you're a, if you're blind you will navigate and operate using a screen reader. So this in itself is a is a real challenge for um the people that are writing and controlling the standards because it's 
it's a very different set of needs and a very different set of requirements and the th that has created some challenges for the creation of, of standards and, and, and will continue to do so um, because again there's such complexity uh, in in the needs and requirements because you've got sort of conflicting needs even within the in, in the Koga community you, you've got different sets of needs so so a lot of it is, is then focused on the ability to to start to customize stuff and to to uh, enable people to consume information and use interfaces in a way that suits them and that they can understand uh, and, and that then is placing requirements upon people as they design and produce websites and apps that they're not they haven't expected or, or experienced before or don't know how to test so so there's quite a lot of, uh, of, of challenges still to be overcome in this space but um, but John's also you've been working on on some of this stuff around personalization and around simplification and using AI haven't you yes uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to talk about that next um, yeah so I have a dream and my dream is that we're going to be able to understand text on the web the first time we read it and so I'm taking two approaches one is an AI driven text simplification approach uh, and the other is uh, creating a way for humans to reliably create simple text that people can understand. And so I think of them as the AI is the long term and the human curated one is the short term, but they're intertwined because what's really cool in, a, in an odd way is that the big stumbling block for AI in text simplification is that it doesn't have an understanding of what the text is. It doesn't have any worldview, any common sense. It can't. Uh, so if you present it with a list of short synonyms, it can't choose the right one because it doesn't understand the context of the sentence. What's interesting about that is that the, also people with intellectual disabilities they have very or limited or no worldview uh, common sense uh, it's because they're one big reason is because they are restricted in their and I'm talking general okay there are plenty of people who this does not apply to so but they live at home they go to work they the primary people they di they interact with are their families their peers and their staff and so uh part of what i've been exploring is if we can show that our techniques are effective in helping people with intellectual disabilities understand content then it's promising that we could use the same techniques to help AI to understand content. And, uh, and I can go into more detail, but essentially that's the premise, the idea that I've been exploring. So I, I just finished a two year pilot study with people with intellectual disabilities where I grabbed text from the web, uh, from sites that they visit, and then, uh, my team simplified some of those passages and we tested the comprehension of the people with ID of the unsimplified text and the simplified text and the way that we simplified text was that we gathered international and national plain language standards we operationalized them and we narrowed them essentially to six that we use to, to simplify the text and it turns out that the great news is that the, the results were significant in that the, there were three groups one with very poor reading skills who had a 33 percent comprehension improvement one with poor to fair reading skills who had a 17 percent comprehension improvement 
And then the last group was good to very good reading skills, and they had no comprehension improvement. So uh, it's that's essentially the kind of work I'm doing. Oh, one more thing. I want to go back to something that Deborah was talking about. <laughs> sure. So uh, this is very important to me. Uh, that people with intellectual disabilities especially, but, but, but autism, the whole cognitive spectrum, cannot be left out of the online education revolution. Everybody, all education is going online. And uh, years ago, the federal government in the US made available funding for people with intellectual disabilities to go to community colleges. And that's great, and I, I wholly endorse it. But, but these folks, they need to take online courses too. And so one of the things I'm doing is uh, developing a virtual tutor idea where we detect comprehension trouble and then we offer the content maybe in a different way, maybe uh, text to speech or maybe video or maybe we, with word definitions, all kinds of things. And the reason that's important to me is because any kind of progress we make there as well with comprehension also ties back to the idea of making text on the web understandable by everybody. So, I mean, there's, there's so much in that. So There is um, so much in that. It's yeah. powerful. So, um, um, where to go first? So, I, I, I was going to, yeah, uh, Antonio, I see you've got a question. There was just one thing I wanted to say was around the whole um, teaching computers to understand stuff. That's a fantastic example of how research into accessibility actually is enabling innovation in lots of other spaces. And, um, you know, it's for me. I can see that having huge potential in in some of the areas where we're already working in in large organisations like mine that are not related to accessibility, but it's going to have a massive you know positive knock on effect. I think it will have a great effect for for cognitive accessibility, but I, I can see it having a huge other effect. So Antonio, I'll shut up and let you ask your question. <laughs> You're on mute. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Neil. No, John, uh, customer experience is one of the three areas in marketing, to, uh, one of the three areas of investment in marketing. You know? There's a huge effort every year for all in this area where all companies are trying to focus on improving their engagement with their customers. But often we see that marketing efforts don't really go into the space of, of accessibility and you often see campaigns uh, and, and marketing initiatives where or they don't have captions or the websites don't, they are not really accessible to everyone. So why do you think that marketeers are not taking this into, into accessibility into their own programs? Uh, because there's a massive value of, of creating accessibility websites, applications, because that opens the door for uh, consumers who they are missing. I wholly agree with you. And over the years, as an accessibility evangelist, I have made that very point. Why would you want to exclude, at, at this point, 25% of the people in the world or in the country uh, from being customers. And I have had various responses to that, um, but essentially, I don't know. I wish I knew. I, I, there's not one thing. Uh, I, I, I do want to say that part, there's a tie-in here as well that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is that this work also applies to other populations such as non-native language speakers. And uh, marketing isn't just, when we talk about accessibility, 
we're also talking about the marketing wants to have the widest reach. And so what kind of simple language could we use in marketing that would reach an international audience? And one of the things I talk about on the online learning front is that in the US, every university wants foreign students because they pay full boat. And they don't want to sit in a classroom listening to a lecture that they really don't understand because they don't have a great command of, in this case, English. And on a simple level, they could, they could have on a, an online video where they could back it up and listen to it again. Closed captioning would help with that. But the text also of the online courses, the simpler it is, the better they can understand it and the better that translate tools like Google will do with that text to convert it into their language. And so going back to marketing, I propose to you that simple text in marketing, simplified language, simplified content would go a long way for an international reach. In my screen, okay. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Um, we, Antonio and I both work in a multinational organization. Um, we may be headquartered in France, but as my colleague reminded me, we are not a French company, we are a European company. Um, and we have an awful lot of people, including you know, tens of thousands of people in North America, whose first language is not English, but it is the language of our business. And so uh, creating instructions and content and policies and processes and procedures that are easily understandable would have a hugely beneficial effect on our organization. And in fact, it is something that we are looking at. So um, it's, we're, we're working with an organization called Textio. Uh, and originally, we started off looking at this from a removing bias uh, uh, standpoint, uh, because we want to make sure that we're attracting talent and we're writing job descriptions, et cetera. Um, but again, we're also looking at how we can simplify that lang uh, simplify language and help people create better, more understandable language. So yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, John, 100% that this is very impactful for organizations and outside of COGA as well. Well, I'm so glad you brought up the fairness uh, issue because I've been, I've been increasingly involved in it. All of the, so the way that machine learning works is through massive amounts of training data. And if those training data include biases, then we are teaching AI our biases. We absolutely do not want to do that because if we do, people won't trust it. That's a big reason. And what's, to me, what's, one of the things that's very interesting is that for people with disabilities to be represented in those training data, they have to uh, self-disclose. They have to identify themselves in some way as having a disability, and they have a lot of incentive not to do that. So it, it's a conundrum uh, that we're going to have to solve. Because and, and I, and it's yeah, happened. and yeah. and I will just note because that's a very good point. That is more of a problem in the United States than it is in yes, other countries, absolutely. especially absolutely. countries, you know, the UK and Europe, where they, um, you know, the self-identification is part of the process, and it not as a way for us to discriminate against people, but so that you know we can actually help them. So we make things um, a little bit harder in the United States with these issues, but I. Um, you know, it, but, and, and, you know, technology keeps changing. And I know that we had um, a, 
a guest from Siemens, uh, Rob Newhouser, I believe, uh, Antonio had invited him as a guest, and he was talking about unconscious bias and also five generations in the workforce, which ATOS also has. And most companies have minimum of three, probably four, and a lot have five. They just haven't thought about it. So it's interesting, all of these unconscious bias conversations and the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. And, and then at the same time, we often see, um, the, and this is not just a US phenomena, um, which is whatever, but we often see groups that are supporting and doing marketing campaigns for, um, you know, the community of people with disabilities not taking the time to be accessible themselves. I have people come to me all the time saying, well, I know I do a regular podcast and I'm interviewing people about disability inclusion, but it's too expensive to caption my video, my, my video so I'm just not going to do it. And it's, it's really interesting to see so many of these disability persons organizations and marketing campaigns focused on including people with disabilities and they're not accessible and I think that was part of the direction Antonio was going in and oh, that was, yeah yeah and and but there was something is because sometimes we look at especially at the Fortune 500 uh, they look out for for Gartner and Forrester for guidance and oh, you don't okay. see Gartner and Forrester often or at least being clearly and being explicit about accessibility in the context of cosmic experience, you don't really see them having that talk. You might see somehow, sometimes a line of a, on a phrase or a quote about inclusion, but you don't really see them being explanatory, how can marketeers bridge the gap here? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I agree. It's kind of ironic because I'm, I'm actually sat with a Forrester report from 2016 which uh, Microsoft sponsored, <laughs> actually on my desktop at the moment, talking about the total market impact of of accessibility. But you're right, um, that's an anomaly. It's not something that um, that comes up in their day-to-day -day analysis or anything else. So they'll do the one-off reports. Uh, you've got one or two really great people at Gartner, like uh, Andrew Johnson, who um, are passionate about accessibility and write about it and push it, but, but it's not something that the analysts uh, per se as a group, as a as an industry, talk about. And they should because this is these are economic, socio-demographic megatrends, and they're going to be driving business decisions, technology decisions for decades to come, uh, and they're missing a trick here. Well, unfortunately and fortunately in the U.S., the, the significant driver of accessibility is lawsuits. Uh, and it's uh, disappointing to me because I would rather that companies go the, the route that Antonia was talking about where they're, they recognize that a very large percent of the population of their customers have disabilities and they want to make sure that they're inc included as customers. But that argument has never worked for me when I've talked to corporations uh, and, uh, and businesses. And so now, at least in the US, the driver is lawsuit. And so part of what you can do is risk, talk to corporations about risk mitigation. You don't want to be sued. so. And you don't want that because it's going to be very expensive and because the public relations disaster, right? But even that doesn't, isn't effective in getting change. And so what, what I have seen is that when I become involved uh, with helping organizations make their web presences accessible more and more, it's because they're, they're being sued. And I, I just want to comment on that because, um, and I also want to um, lovingly um, put the blame a little bit on our accessibility industry because um, I agree this the way we do things in the U.S. We have le legislation and then we sue each other and we pound it out. I have people say to me all the time, Deborah, you need to stop talking about compliance and risk and talk about, you know, the return on investment and the value to the business, which I do all the time. 
but I will, to be honest, uh, many of the access, anybody can say they're an ex accessibility expert. It's, it's very easy to say, oh yeah, and it becomes real buyer beware. But part of the problem that has happened um, in, in just looking from the lens of the United States and the litigation is that the accessibility industry in the United States has not done a good job at working with these multinational or these large national corporations to truly help them be accessible. They think, oh, I'm gonna bring in this company. And there was even one really big company in the US in accessibility and big in the US, except that accessibility company is like $10 million a year. And they they sent out a blog that said, um, if you get a demand letter or you get sued, who are you gonna call? And um, and then they said, just have your lawyers call our lawyers. And so I, I part of accessibility professionals in the United States are part of this problem because I heard this really large uh, national corporation the other day was saying, Deborah, they do not understand the complexity that we have to deal with. I mean, what, what Neil and Antonio are dealing with at ATOS, a multi-billion euro uh, company that is in countries all over the world, it's very different from saying, okay, so all you do, it's very easy. Just tag every, so the accessibility industry, and I have had many conversations with IAAP about this, but we are part of the problem and we need to really do a better job of having technology, you know, solve some of these technology problems, but having the standards. And then you have people saying, well, we don't need those stupid standards. Um, So-and-so can see this, or I'm just gonna come up with a whole nother way. It's like, okay, stop it. We've all agreed as a world on what the standards are. We've tied our legislation. So I just wanna say that it's not just the corporations in the US saying, we don't give a crap about accessibility. Part of it is that, they don't know where to go to get real answers and real solutions, so they stay accessible. I'm, and I'm so glad, no, why would you be sorry? Uh, well, I hate to rant, but it's right. like, this is so ridiculous. We've got to solve these things. Okay, so I'd like, to, <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about how I'm assisting in helping the World Wide Web Consortium with its new effort called SILVER, with it, so it's Silver is reimagining how web accessibility standards could work. And an example is that instead of having A, AA, and AAA, maybe we have gold, silver, and bronze, you know, the Olympics metaphor that everybody understands. And also, um, my role in Silver to this point has been to help put into plain language success criteria and supporting documentation so that not just developers can understand it if they can, but everybody, policymakers, lay people, uh, you know, politicians, if, if everybody can understand what the, what the request is, that's gonna help ameliorate, hopefully significantly, what Deborah's talking about. And, and absolutely, um, you know that work is is so badly needed. The 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 translation into comprehensible language of workagies is um, yeah, that will that will do so much more for enabling people, lay people who are making websites, to understand what it is that they need to do in order to make their websites work for people with disabilities because I've joked oftentimes that actually uh, WCAG is a cognitive accessibility challenge in itself because oh, yeah. it, 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 it's it's so, so complex <laughs> <laughs> so and, and if, if we're the ones working on it don't understand how it's working yeah. then how can we expect others to implement it? Well, a really great example, I think, is that uh, two CSUNs ago, the Silver Task Force convened for two days. There was 30 people uh, uh, from all over the world, accessibility experts, and I was one of them. And uh, a, a man from Japan, his name is Makoto, stood up and talked about ARIA. ARIA is an accessibility standard that helps uh, interactivity on websites. And he said, as far as he knew, 
nobody in the nation of Japan had ever implemented ARIA because they can't understand the instructions about how to do it. And oh, these are people. So true. This is so yeah. true. My goodness. Sorry, John, to interrupt. No, no. Oh my gosh, so true. This is so powerful. What a powerful conversation this turned into. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, so that, I mean, these are people who want to implement ARIA. You know, so that's all, really all I want to say for now. Yeah. Oh, I, and uh, yeah, I, I, it's the, yeah, the, the, you've got the two things going on there, you know, in terms of, um, you know the, the the language differences and the complexity, just putting that barrier in in place. I mean, to a certain extent, with with ARIA and you know ARIA for those that don't know stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Um, it, it essentially, it was created because there were um, things that had sprung up in the development of websites and interactivity that that weren't being coped with by traditional web accessibility uh, implementations, and this was a way to make stuff work with uh, assistive tech. Um, not all of it has made it into the new HTML guidelines um, and standards. Uh, I wish that it had, because that would actually make things um, a lot easier because people understand HTML better than they understand accessibility. Yeah, uh, I, I want to say something important to me, and sure. that is, uh, when I've been talking about text simplification and English is my focus, but I'm always thinking about mm -hmm. how everything I do is going to be able to apply to all languages. Yes. So we're starting with English for good reason, but for the vast majority of languages spoken in the world, these same techniques will work. So I just want to make sure I express that. I think it's really important, actually, because we, as English-speaking accessibility practitioners, often focus on the Anglosphere, and we forget about the rest of the world, which is, you know, far more populous than us, when we're designing standards, designing technology a lot of the time. Um, and there is also, as Antonio is keen to remind us regularly, a lot of stuff going on in in the Latin languages, you know, particularly Spanish, Portuguese, etc., especially in Latin America. So um, I know. And I'm excited to be going to the Global Disability Summit in Buenos Aires in a, in a few weeks' time. I want to learn more about what they're doing. Your work will equally be applicable for for their needs. Um, and, and they um, have a lot of stuff going on around dyslexia. So we interviewed only a few weeks ago a, a wonderful lady called Ruth Rosenstein, who's doing a lot of work around dyslexia. I would be very happy to introduce you afterwards because I think you'd find that interesting. And and she's also doing this as a non-native Spanish speaker because she's Polish origin in Argentina working on, on language and dyslexia. So um, I'm, I'm sure there would be a rich conversation. Oh. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I look forward to that connection. Thank you, Neil. I, um, I, I want to talk about uh, another approach that's apropos of what you're now talking about, and that is uh, we can potentially treat typical text and simplified text as separate languages and use neural machine translation, recurrent neural networking, to um, to teach AI how to simplify language. And we published about this in 2016, and, that, and, the, and what's cool about that lately is I've been seeing uh, uh, a paper just came out about Dutch text simplification, and it cited that paper. And MIT, uh, they invited me to an inclusion conference, and they cited my, that paper. And, uh, I, I just like that people are paying attention to this idea of let's make the, the content on the web 
simple for everybody and it's an international effort. And then the other thing is that inclusion is very broad. It's not just disability. I mean, that's what we're focused on, but it includes LGBTQ and ethnicity and race and economic, uh, you know, it's, it's everything. And I just, I just love that. And, and that, and all of those groups cannot be discriminated from training data for AI. Uh, I'm just making that point again. So yeah, that's a, a broad, a that's important. a broad based. Yeah. That it's a broad based inclusion that we have to be very careful of. Yeah. And, 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 and we are pretty much at the end of our time, but I think you've ended on, on like one of the most important points of our time and of our technology. Yeah. The, the stuff that we are putting in to our AI right now, the information, the biases, everything else will affect how we implement technology that's going to have a profound effect on society going forward. So we really need to be taking real care with this. Uh, I need to thank our supporters um, who keep us fed and watered and keep Access Chat going and sustainable. So that's Barclays Access, Microlink and MyClearText. Uh, we really appreciate all of the support that we get from you guys. Uh, thank you, John. It's been a fascinating and uh, enlightening chat. Uh, and we really look forward to the discussions that this is going to stimulate on Twitter. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.